pitchers and catchers report in about a week. Are there any teams in baseball at this point who are going into 2024 completely hopeless? You are locked on MLB. Your daily MLB podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, baseball fans. Welcome to Locked On MLB, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. This is the daily podcast. We talk about all of Major League Baseball. I am your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. Please call me Sully. I am a podcaster who has been doing baseball shows for well over a decade now, and we're right on the verge of starting my sixth season. This is my sixth year here at the Lockdown Podcast Network, where it is indeed your team every day. Follow us at Lockdown MLB Pods on Twitter or whatever it's called now, and Instagram. I'm your pal, Sully. I'm at Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram and please subscribe to us on YouTube and uh, yeah, hit the subscribe button. I put shows up, up all the time and all season long. We're doing five every week because it's, you know, it's the season. And today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account and use code LOCKDOWN for $20 off of your first purchase. Uh, let me just go through a couple of, I guess for the lack of a better word, uh, house cleaning things. Uh, I I screwed up a name yesterday when I was talking about the the Giants and their off season, and I I missed I I didn't say Jung Hu Lee's name correctly. I feel badly about that. Uh, I, I I said another player's name, and I'm sure a lot of people will uh, get on me for that. And do you know what? What do you want? I was doing it live, and I didn't have every note in front of me, so I apologize for that. And also, let's talk a little bit about. The trivia question, which was, what member of the Olympic team of 1992, the Cuban Olympic team in 1992 that won the first Olympic gold medal for baseball, went on to become a four-time World Series champion and a ALCS Most Valuable Player, uh, John Murphy Jr., Scott Campbell, Court Stell, a bunch of you got it correct. It was Orlando El Duque Hernandez. Uh, by, by the way, I'm a classic Yankee hater. Uh, I lived in New York during the Joe Torre years. And I have to say, even though he was a Red Sox killer, there was part of me, I'm not necessarily sure I, I liked Orlando Hernandez El Duque, but I admired him and he was the one I kind of said, yeah, he's cool. He's cool. The reason why I had that admiration for El Duque, first of all, he had an absolutely phenomenal nickname. When you have a nickname that's more famous than your actual name, that's that's the kind of nickname I want. Most people have said Orlando Hernandez. Orlando Hernandez. El Duque. Oh, yeah. One of the reasons why I, I liked El Duque in that sense is that this was really at the beginning of the time when there was social media in its infancy was beginning and there's a lot of it was basically the internet and like AOL and AOL chat rooms and people posting stuff online that was really the beginning of the internet social media world and there seemed to be no uh uh lack of access to information at the time and yet there was still a mysterious quality to El Duque Hernandez. He was this great, brilliant pitcher whose prime, I mean, think about that. He was the star pitcher of the 1992 team, and he made his debut in the major leagues in 1998. There was this aura about him because his brother, Livon Hernandez, became a World Series MVP and a playoff MVP. Both of those have a little bit of an asterisk next to it because his record-setting strikeout performance in the, NL, in the NLCS in 97 was because basically uh, if you didn't throw it in the stands, Eric Gregg was going to throw call it a strike that day. And while he did win two games in the World Series against Cleveland, he had a super high ERA, and the MVP of that series should have been Moises Salou. I digress. But when he became the darling of that year's postseason, 
they kept saying, oh, he has a brother who's even better. He has a brother who's even better. And his half-brother Orlando Hernandez got himself on a raft, floated himself to the Dominican Republic from Cuba, and then um, you know, landed with the Yankees in the offseason. And there was that sense because he had his hat down, he had this strange delivery, his background was a little bit unclear how old was he was he older than he said and and he did he wasn't speaking english to the reporters and yet seemed to have this he had this kind of sly grin like he knew something you didn't know and while he was a good pitcher during the regular season he always came up big in the postseason was the world the nl geez, alcs mvp against the red sox in 1999 and i'll never forget um in 05 when the red sox were in the playoffs in 05 and they lost the first two games to the chicago white sox who were a very very good team that year but this was coming off of the year where the red sox came back from a 3-0 deficit and so down 2-0 to a team uh didn't seem as daunting and the Red Sox, while they were losing in game three on the verge of being swept, they were rallying. They had the bases loaded and nobody out. And you just got the sense, yeah, they're going to clearly take the lead. At this. this is going to be beginning. Of, this is the beginning of it. And then Ozzy Guillen, the manager of the White Sox, went to the bullpen and relieved the starting pitcher and brought in El Duque Hernandez. And I remember basically... I was listening to the game while I was driving my car. And I think I said out loud, that's not fair. And the reason I said it's not fair was I forgot El Duque Hernandez was on the White Sox. I forgot that. And he was a middle reliever. And he was a Red Sox killer. And I thought, you can't do that. You can't just bring in a Red Sox killer from the Yankees. But no, he was with the White Sox. I totally forgot he was on the White Sox that year. And what did Orlando Hernandez do? He was in a bases loaded, nobody out situation, and he got out of it. And the White Sox went on to sweep the Red Sox and go on to win the World Series. So there you go. The answer, that's my long-winded way of saying the answer is El Duque Hernandez. Now, pitchers and catchers are going to be reporting over the next couple of weeks. And I was really thinking about this. One of the advantages of the expanded playoffs is we are going into the year with fewer teams feeling hopeless. I have grown, some people have accused me of being uh, overly negative and critical. I'll always be critical of things that I don't agree with in anything in life. But I have grown to think that if we just do a tweak here or a tweak there to the expanded playoffs the way they are right now, I'm not, as I scratch my nose, I've become a fan. The main tweak I would have is I if the I've always advocated to end the season on Labor Day, but if we're going to continue ending it in early October, let's say we have uh, the season end on a Sunday. The playoffs start on Monday. The wild card playoffs start on Monday. That's part of your punishment. You don't get time off. You got to travel that night. You got to eat the little you know peanuts and drink the little tomato juice on the plane that night. They start the next day. And then you know, you have games one on Monday, two on Tuesday, three on Wednesday, and then game one of the division series is Thursday. If you are the division winner, you get three days off to rest up, but you don't have a whole damn week off, which screws up your timing. That was my big problem about uh, the Olympics taking over baseball for a few weeks in uh, in in twenty twenty eight. Although. If it's a one-time only thing, then maybe give it a shot. But I digress. But one of the things that's happened, and I think this is a positive spin on it, is that we're going into the year and there really are not as many hopeless teams as you would think. Way back in the good old days where there was no playoffs, you just won the, you know, whoever was in first place in each league at the end of the year goes to the World Series. There'd be four or five teams in each league that went into the year going, nope, there's no, there's no reason to get into this game. None. I have this, I've, I've referred to this guy, I like referring to this, this, this preview book that I had from uh, when I was a kid in 1980. 
and they do projections of who they thought were, would win and everything like that. And so many teams in this projection, they talk about, well, they don't have a shot this year. They don't have a shot this year. That was when there was only two divisions in each league. And there would be, oh, nine, ten teams that went into the year with absolutely no shot. Even in the wild card era, there was when it was just one wild card team, you would you would point to maybe four or five teams that absolutely zero hope of making the postseason. But now, now we're going into this year, and I'm struggling to find which teams have no chance. Oh, don't worry. I found a few. Hey, let's talk a little bit about our friends at game time. This is a time when we're talking about the season beginning. Well, now's the time to start thinking about which games you're going to be buying tickets for. But sometimes you can make long-term decisions. By the way, I already bought tickets for the final game in Oakland this year. It might be the final game ever in Oakland. But sometimes you have a weekend open up. And sometimes you have time open up. It's like, oh, I want to go see this game. Or, oh, I have a free Friday. And this has happened to me a couple of times. I want to be able to see. I've seen a, a basketball game here in Los Angeles. When I was up north, we wanted to see a San Jose Sharks game. And do you know what? You should be able to have the ability to just buy your tickets for those events and get some great deals. That's why I use game time. Game Time is the fast and easiest way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. With killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, view from the seats, and their best price guarantee, Game Time requires that the guesswork is no longer part of buying your tickets. And you can use things that when you have your, your device, they have the it's the only app that gives you complete peace of mind when using your making your purchase. You see the view from your seats before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. You got all in prices, and they show the total right up front. You know you're getting a great deal and no hidden fees. You're going to buy these tickets in just seconds and two taps. And with zone deals, you pick the section, and game time can pick your seats for big time savings. What you got to do is you got to take the guesswork of buying tickets totally out of the equation with game time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, and they are guaranteed. <laughs> Hey, let's just remind you that Locked On has begun the first ever 24-7 streaming sports channel on YouTube. And you can now find it on Amazon Fire TV. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today channel on Amazon Fire TV. So who's totally out of it? Honestly, which teams are completely have, have totally no chance going into this year? Oddly, one of the teams that I think has no realistic chance are the Red Sox. For whatever reason, Netflix has decided to follow the 2024 Red Sox around. But there is a scenario where the Red Sox could be a wild card team. There is young talent on the team and a couple of decent young pitchers. And they signed a bunch of veteran pitchers. And if the, you know, the Giolitos of the world, you know, and Tanner Howe can all of them have big rebound seasons or not even just moderate rebound seasons, this team could be a wild card team. Because remember last year, you know, they were in last place, blah, blah, blah. They were only six games under 500. And in fact, they were ahead of the Yankees with a, as a, above 500 until September when they basically pulled the plug on the season. The, remember, to make the playoffs, you have to be a mid-80 win team. And so to say a team that was a 78 win team last year has no shot, well, I, I'm not sure I'm buying that. Especially when you have 
look at the teams that are right ahead of them. Have the Yankees improved? Yes, but they've improved from an 82-win team. I think they're better than 82 wins. I don't think they're as good as they were when they won 99 games. But there's still a ton of question marks in that pitching staff. And, yeah, I know Juan Soto is, is this great acquisition, and, and it's a fantastic thing. But I don't know. that, that I'm, It doesn't take a great feat of imagination to see them hovering around the low 80 wins. It takes no amount of imagination to see Toronto and Tampa Bay regressing. I'll talk about Toronto a little bit in the third segment. Baltimore is obviously a team that's in it, but which team is hopeless? Of course, there's hope for the Red Sox. I don't think they're going to win. I don't think they're going to have a very good season. But I I think back to 2013 when I said this team is hopeless and they went on to win the World Series. They're building upon a 78 and 84 win season. If everyone plays a little bit better, yeah. So I don't think they're totally, completely out of it. At this point, I don't think, I think there's only one team, and I'll get to them in a second, in both centrals, the NL and the AL central, that has no real shot, and that's the Chicago White Sox. I think the, I think the White Sox are a team that is in full rebuild mode and are not, they don't really have any squad that I look at, anyone on that team that I think like, all right, this team is going to completely rebound. But again, it's the central. The Twins were an 87 and 75 win team last year, and they ran away with the damn thing. They won by nine games. They didn't reach 88 wins, but they had nine games above Detroit. And they've lost a couple of their top pitchers. So if the Twins really re, you know, regress to the mean and they are affected by the change that they have, is it crazy to think the White Sox could have a better year than you're expecting, could get out of the gate fast? Now, it's critical for both Sox, the White Sox and the Red Sox, to get out of the gate fast and to catch people off guard. Do I think it's totally hopeless? No, not really. And as I said the other day, we had Jack Johnson on. This is the most excited I've ever been for a 106-loss team with the Kansas City Royals. I think the Royals are going to be hugely improved this year. And if the Twins fall off, if Cleveland can't get their act together, if Detroit stumbles and the White Sox play the way they're expecting to play, the Royals could contend. It's possible. I don't look at them as a team that think, all right, they are completely, it's a, it's a complete impossibility. In the NL Central, forget it, every team. Who was in last place last year? The Cardinals. A lot of people are picking them to win the division. The Pirates have tons of talent. Cincinnati have tons of talent. The Cubs have tons of talent. And while the Brewers have lost key members and everything like that, they're coming off a 92-win season. In the, uh, in the West... In the American League, obviously Oakland. Oakland is, okay, there's one, a team that has zero hope this year. They're coming off of one of the worst teams they've ever had in their history, 112 lost team. They have zero support. They're wandering through the desert. Of course, it would be one of the greatest sports stories of all time. It would be basically the movie Slapshot if the A's on the verge of just, you know, people wondering should they even fold them come on and wind up winning the division. You have no idea how much I would love to see that actually happen. It has no chance of happening, but yeah, okay. The A's, I will grant you. What about the Angels? Do the Angels have a shot to be a contender? I think it's a long shot, but maybe they're energized under Ron Washington, and maybe with the cloud of what's going to happen to Shohei Otani not hanging over the team, maybe they'll relax. Maybe that they'll improve by seven or eight games, which will put them right around 500. I wouldn't put the Angels on it are totally hopeless. But I really think the only team, only one team in the American League is going to this year with zero hope and zero hope on many different levels. And that's the Oakland A's. You can make a case, long shot case, and, and probably the White Sox, but because they play in the Central, I don't totally count it out. So really, the only American League team that I think has zero chance going into this year is Oakland. Now, 
I don't think the White Sox are going to do piddly poo. I don't think the Red Sox are going to do piddly poo. I don't think the Angels are going to do piddly poo. But you can't go into this year and think, all right, there's zero chance of that happening. Well, that's pretty optimistic if you're going into the year as an American League fan. When we come back, we're going to briefly talk about the very few teams in the National League who are going into this year with zero hope. Do you know what it's time for? It's time for the Super Bowl. I don't usually talk about the Super Bowl here, uh, but it is a rematch of the Royals and the Giants of 2014. So that's really how I think about it. But it's also time to think about FanDuel. FanDuel is America's number one sports book. And with Super Bowl Sunday coming up here, got the Chiefs, got the 49ers. I'm going to be sitting on the couch, we'll be eating good food, talking with good friends. And I'm going to be placing some super bets for that Super Bowl. FanDuel has so many ways for you to end the season with a W or two or three. Not only can you bet on who's going to win Super Bowl 58, but FanDuel also has bets for how many players will score a touchdown, how many points will be scored, so much more. New customers join today and you'll get $200 of bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more win. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, which is the official sportsbook partner of the National Football League. And one more quick reminder that Locked On Sports has created the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Now you can find it on Amazon Fire TV. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day from local experts at Locked On plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today channel now on Amazon Fire TV. I'm sorry, I just sniffled right into the microphone. I humbly apologize for that. Hey, uh, in the National League, again, I can't call any team in the Central totally out of it. Cardinals, Pirates, Reds, Cubs, Brewers. There's a scenario where all of them could would do potentially very well. I'm not going to call the Padres out of it because do you want, even though they lost their manager and they traded Juan Soto away, they got some good pitchers back for the Yankees and they still have Manny Machado. They still have uh, Tatis. They still have very good players. They got Bogarts on that team. They still got good pitchers on that team. It's not, and they finished just two games behind the defending National League West champion, or the National League champion, in the D-backs and the Giants, who I think are going to be, I think the Giants are going to do well, especially if they do what I recommend they do is go on supermarket sweep. The Braves are obviously a huge team. The Phillies, I think, are going to do quite well. The Marlins, well, I mean, they're a playoff team from last year, so you can't completely count them out. And the Mets, while they had a dismal season last year, it was a 75 and 87 dismal season. Not a hundred loss dismal season. And so there is a scenario where the Mets can turn things around. And teams that fire Buck Showalter usually go on to the World Series. That's just the way the world works. And the minute the Orioles do that with this team, it's gonna be it'll be four for four. So in essence, there are really only two teams in the National League that have no shot. The Colorado Rockies are gonna be bad. They're just going to be bad. I'm sorry. You know, Doyle and Jones and some of these other players who are on the team are going to be are, – are, give them hope for the future. But, yeah, this this team stinks. It's they're, they're going to be bad. And what they should be doing is just keep bringing up young players, trying them out, and waiting to see one of the teams on the top of the West to collapse. And the other team that I think has no real hope are the Washington Nationals. And the Nats are the Nats are doing the right thing. They did the right thing a few years ago because they had a wonderful stretch in the 2010s where they won the you know they won the division in 2012, 2014, 2016, 2017, and they won the World Series in 2019. That's about as good a decade as you can hope for for a team that had nothing to root for before that. But they got old and they cut bait. 
They traded away their players when they still could. They filled the team with young players and young prospects. They didn't do too many victory laps with the squad. And now you're starting to see the, you know, the keep it Ruiz's and all of them are starting to build a squad that might contend, but they're not going to contend this year. And they're, st- they're basically staying the course and it's a smart thing to do. So, you go into this year, there are 30 teams, and 27 of them have hope. Two of them are, we're not going to win this year, but come come and see the young players. We're going to be good soon. And then you have the A's. And with people always talk about how so many, you know, it's always the same teams and small market teams have no hope. I think 27 for 30 teams going into the regular season with a sense of, hey, maybe this year something will happen. Uh, I'm sorry. That's super positive. That's absolutely super positive. Now, are there some managers who should be looking over their shoulders? Um, I, you know, Aaron Boone should, but he won't be because Cashman is there. And as long as Cashman has a job, and apparently he signed, he signed the same contract as the Pope, and he won't ever fire Boone. So Boone has no, there's no issue with Boone. Um, if the Cardinals come out of the gate uh, stumbling, I think Oliver Marmol will have to face the music. Uh, it would make the uh, it would make the Cardinals just look incompetent if you know, they had dumped Schilt and allowed uh, Marmol to take over the team and see him flop. So yeah, the Cardinals have to come out of the gate strong. So Marmol's job is on the line um perhaps scott service's job is on the line with the uh, seattle mariners if they come stumbling out of the gate as they finish the season in a disappointing manner remember they were in first place at one point in september i don't think his job should be on the line but this is the way things operate i think that uh you know there's some teams that are going in with you know with rotten teams i don't think they're gonna i don't think that dave martinez is of the world he's there for the long term the main, the main person who I can't believe still has a job is uh, uh, Schneider with the uh, the Blue Jays. That he's he had back-to-back years making bizarre and bad decisions and seeing collapses in the postseason with a very talented Blue Jays team. I think he is the one who has to be looking over his shoulder the most. So, you know, in St. Louis, Toronto. And um, what was the other one I said? Oh, Seattle. Those are the three cities where you may see managerial changes if the team, their teams don't come blazing out of the gate. So three managers are on the hot seat, really. And only three teams, you can't look at me in the eye and come up with a scenario. There's no scenario you could look at me and say the Nats, the Rocks, and the A's are going to be contenders. But that's pretty good. That's pretty good. That's a good ratio. So come on, pitchers and catchers, let's report. And can't wait to get this started. Hey, uh, there's a trivia question for you. I was thinking about this. The If you just take home runs hit in San Francisco, the three players in Giants history who have hit the most home runs as San Francisco Giants are Barry Bonds, Willie McCovey, and Willie Mays. Barry Bonds hit 586 home runs as a San Francisco Giant. Willie McCovey, who, remember, also played a few years with the San Diego Padres and a cup of coffee with the A's, finished with 469 home runs with the Giants. Uh, Willie Mays finished his time in San Francisco with 459 homers. He hit a bunch as a member of the New York Giants and a handful of them won with the New York Mets. So those are the four play, the three players, Bonds, McCovey, and Mays are the three players who hit the most as a San Francisco giant. Here's a trivia question. Who comes in fourth? Who has the fourth highest total of home career home runs as a member of the San Francisco giants, not the New York giants, just in San Francisco. That's your trivia question for you today. And you can leave your trivia question answers here on YouTube 
or put them at Lockdown MLB Pods on Twitter or on Instagram. I'm your pal Sully. I'm at Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. Being pretty positive about 27 out of 30 teams going into this year thinking, hey, we got a shot at this. This has been Locked On MLB for the 8th day of February 2024. I am your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. Please call me Sully.